Like that test one, two, test one, two. You have a good voice. Oh, thank yeah. you. It's perfect. All right. Perfect. Sweet. <laughs> Let me just load I'm up. glad to be one. doing this, you guys. Yeah, welcome. It's Mitch Horowitz. Here I am. Fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, good to be here, y'all. We've already had a very... Uh, we already did the podcast, but we Right, we should have recorded it. that. <laughs> <laughs> Clandestinely. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I wonder, I'm like, is it better to, do, to record that part, or is it better to do that first and then get on here? And I think in this case, it was good that we did all that, because I'm like, oh, you're a real motherfucker. Like, right, I, right. I'm like, cool. I'm glad I know that before we're recording this. <laughs> do you know how, actually, we, we met you, and um, I, I wonder if you, if you remember this at all, but I knew you were a real motherfucker from the first time we met you, because we met you at... Uh, an event called Whitma. We were we were on a panel there, and you were on yes. a panel there. And uh, man, every time you spoke, you brought the house down. And I, I was oh, out shit. in the audience, and I was like, "Damn, this guy's a heavy hitter." But when you really got me, is uh, there was a dude sitting in the audience who was like, "He's having a rough go." I don't know what was going on. Do you remember this? I he remember kept, a dude like, asking me about my research pin, but that's the only some, recollection I have. Th this kid kept like saying, like he was like interrupting you guys and saying stuff, and you were just you handled it. You you stood up and you're like, why don't you come up here? And you gave him the mic. <laughs> you let this guy speak there, and you listened to him, and you asked him questions, and like you neutralized what would otherwise I could classify as like a heckler. Oh no shit! And, and like I think everyone really took something away from that. No shit. Yeah, it was a really it was a cool moment. It's funny because right before we got on here, you were telling me about a moment you saw somebody kind of bring masculine energy and respect into a room. Oh right, um, that was a, a panel that I saw when I was 17 years old, and there was a New York City nightclub promoter named Howie Montag, who died of AIDS in 1991, and. He assembled this panel, and it included Lou Reed, Madonna, James Brown, which was sort of an unusual introduction wow. to the mix, and <laughs> some other people. And it was in a big, big ballroom here in New York City. And he said to the audience, I just want to start by saying these people deserve respect, and I'm going to see to it that they get respect. And I was 17 years old, and I had never heard the term respect used in that way before. It's used more frequently now, but you didn't hear yeah. that word so much back then. And I thought, right fucking on. Yeah. You know, you can like them, you can dislike them, you can ask your questions. You know, we didn't have phones back then, so I guess you could stare at your fucking feet if you <laughs> wish to, mm. but you will show them respect. Wow. And I thought it was great. Yeah. It reminds me of Henry Rollins. His he does like a speech about Ween. Like you should respect oh, these guys. Yeah. I don't know if you've yeah. ever heard that. If any of the listeners haven't, type, uh, Google uh, Henry Rollins Ween. Okay. He gives a six-minute speech because apparently they opened for him. This is back in the day, like late eighties. Yeah. They opened for him, and the crowd like booed them off. Henry Rollins came out and gave a six minute crazy speech about how basically Ween is like the guiding light of the whole music scene and you'll be lining up to see this band 20 years from now. They'll be selling out arenas. It's so funny. It was basically to like respect to this. Like, and they need, the audience needed to be told. Sometimes they do. You know, respect as a concept is really interesting yeah. because many years ago, there was a magazine called Science of Mind that asked me to interview this guy named Bill Urey, who was one of the writers of this book, Getting to Yes, which is about negotiating. And I said yes to it, and I was like, oh, this is going to suck, because I thought you can have all the negotiating principles you want, but they don't work when you get on the basketball court. Right. And I was totally, in all frank, just not looking forward to it. I just thought this is going to be boring, and I'm going to write a boring article, and mm -hmm. so it goes. And <clears throat> But he surprised me, because... He had been studying um, outbreaks of violence in prisons. And he said, you know, a lot of people get hurt, obviously, in fights in prisons. And he said, what I found is the vast majority of the time a fight breaks out simply because somebody felt they had been disrespected. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if you can just show somebody respect, and the fact is we all know what that is, yeah. and it's just acknowledging somebody. Mm. And if you can show somebody respect, it's the cheapest fee that you can ever pay in wow. life, and it may change everything. And I was just very, very turned on by that idea. Yeah. You know, there's not an inevitability in all this shit, but it's the perception that someone's been disrespected. Wow. Yeah. We had something just like that with this movie we just released, Wooks, someone called us being like, 
you know, I ended up in the back of your a shot. And yeah, I, it's this guy. He was at a fish show, and we happened to capture him just dancing. He's in the background of one of the shots. This guy writes to us like, "I'm going to sue you." <laughs> for the millions, the untold millions. Oh yeah, yeah. He's right. like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, you will pay me like, you know, unearned money moving forward or whatever it is. Um, yeah, and I think he just needed to be listened to and like understand from our perspective why we made this movie. Okay, well, well, Cass goes to get on the phone with him, and I'm like, tell him. I'm, 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 I'm like, you fucking whip him into shape right. and tell him fuck off. And like, she did the exact opposite. And won this guy over to where now he's like apologizing to us and being like, I actually love this film. I'm sending it to all my friends. Actually, everyone, it was so weird, but she had a very graceful way of, of like you're saying, doling out respect. Being stingy with respect fucks the world up. It really fucks the world up. Wow. And I always tell my kids like, you know, you've got to respect people on the street. You know, you look mm -hmm. people in the eye, you bump into somebody, you say, excuse me. And I can think of so many times where things have gotten tense on the street and everything's been chill simply because of just demonstrating respect to somebody. You mm. know, like during COVID, there was like a homeless dude who was always sleeping on my stoop and I would have to step over him. And, you know, I would just say, hey, how's it going? And, you know, say hello. Never, never had a fucking problem. Mm. And, you know, sometimes there will be a problem, but... People don't think enough about respect and, and what that means. That's probably, I have to believe that if that's responsible for like most outbreaks of violence in prisons, which is what Yuri was saying, it's, it's probably general to life. Oh, yeah. Well, think about uh, like we both grew up in the punk scene, mm -hmm. the mosh pit. Yeah. Why? It, that is a, an outbreak of violence, but yeah. it's not um, people turning on each other. Absolutely. Until you do something disrespectful in there. Mm -hmm. I remember <laughs> I had this weird experience. I was at a show. Maybe it was butthole surfers. I'm dating oh, myself. Man. Boys and girls. You know, <laughs> no, you right know. Now. And the opening act was Guy Lombardo. Wow. And, um, and <clears throat> I got knocked down. And suddenly, you know, I feel this massive pair of hands on my back pulling me. And I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> and I turn around, and it's this big skinhead guy. But he's just got a totally neutral expression on his face, and he was just pulling me up. And I was like, cool. Yeah. Cool. That was respect. Yeah. You know? And it's it makes a awesome. difference. Yeah. I mean, speak about intimate relationships. I mean, our biggest fights is when Sean feels like I'm disrespecting him or not listening to him. I'm or not. the worst with that regard. That's all yeah. it is. And I, I always chalk it up to like uh, a humiliation. You know what I mean? I, I guess I, I associate those two, you know, disrespect yep. and you, you're humiliating me right now. Yeah. Like, why yeah. are you humiliating me? It's That's a big hot button issue for me. And I wrestle with it, frankly, because it's sometimes... Maybe it's real. Sometimes maybe it's just an old scar. And when that scar gets, you know, some lint in it or something, it starts to act up. So one doesn't always know. But I do think it's infinitely better, you know, to err on the side of respect. And uh, frankly, there's probably a lot of marriages and a lot of relationships that would hold together if just, just certain degrees of respect were shown and that might be right. something as simple i know this is going to sound like very domestic but it's like refill the fucking ice cube trays oh, you know it just yeah. shows that you give a shit about the person who's coming to this place after you yeah yeah and it, it makes a hell of a difference it's the last place we look you know it's all these things where we want to get into these dramatic psychological theories about why someone's done this or blah 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 whereas you could just take an off ramp from probably 90 percent of it 90 percent wow. yeah yeah Wow. Um, so I'm very curious. Uh, well, two things, and maybe they go hand in hand. And if they don't, maybe we could find the thread. But the how you got turned on to the occult and mysticism and how you got turned on to punk rock. And is there a connection there? Oh, there's definitely a connection, even though sometimes for me personally, that connection is not necessarily in the lyrics or in the beliefs of the artist. I, I think I remember very, very vividly uh, I was alone in my room one night and I was just staring in a mirror stoned and I must have been listening to a college radio station and the Kennedys came on with Holiday in Cambodia and I was 17 years old and I was like, what is this? You know, and it changed everything for me. It changed everything for me yeah. and it just became this magnetic north. I, 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 I mean... There's nothing in that particular song or there's nothing necessarily in their lyrics that one would say is, is spiritual, but I felt that they were making an effort to tell the truth. Mm. And I knew that I, 
I was looking for that in, in spiritual areas. I didn't want anybody handing me anything from their Bartlett's book of inspiring quotations, <laughs> yeah. which I hate to this day. Yeah. It's like, you know, um, there are simple expressions that have a lot of truth to them, but these things get used as weapons to tell other people what to do, you know, basically, or they get said in such a way that doesn't really honor what they're about. Like mm -hmm. anybody could say, know thyself. Sure, we all pretend to believe in that, but if one really had to stand naked in front of that statement and realize what that meant, it, it appears that whatever profundity is contained in that appears only in application. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get down to that, and I didn't want anybody handing me template. And so I guess when I discovered the Kennedys, I felt like I'm definitely not being handed template and yeah, it was it yeah. was so exciting and then it was the same for black flag and mm. and 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 i guess at that time i was probably like more connected to judaism because i grew up in like a, a fairly traditional jewish household i had an orthodox bar mitzvah and it didn't come until much later i was always interested in other things and going down other byways but it didn't come until much later that that kind of congregational or liturgical spirituality was no longer satisfying to me. Mm. And I wasn't sure it was the truth, quite frankly, because it's religious systems, and, and this is true of every system, can create this mass network of ideas all revolving around the presumption that whoever made these decisions was right and was correct and that there's something perennial here. And so then you have commentaries and these voluminous arguments and answers and Q and A's that just go on and on and on, you know, creating a massive theology. And one doesn't even know whether it works or care whether it works or ask whether the individual feels stronger, more powerful, is more able in his or her relationships. Now, of course, in certain religions, the idea is like, well, what we're doing is healing the world. And if you yeah. believe that, more power to you if that's what you wish to do. But I was haunted by the idea that so much that grew up around all these different theologies was just unverified. It was just unverified. Yeah. And it wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, that's probably when I rediscovered my childhood fascination with the occult. So it was, it was probably in my early 30s that oh. I began to look elsewhere. When I was a kid, I was very deeply into the occult. And then you know, I drifted in and out of it, in and out of it. And then when I was in my th early 30s, I began to go much more deeply back in. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's something about punk rock that really deconstructs things at least for me where i'm like oh they deconstruct the system they say like it's its oh, own mystery school in its own way definitely it yeah. feels like it well because it because unlike when i would step into a catholic church this is how i came up you mm -hmm. do when you go into a show it's it's palpable and you can feel it and, yeah. it and it does feel like it's attuning you to the truth and um for me it, it radicalized me and it sent me down more of the path of being very interested in radical politics and mm -hmm. history and all that kind of stuff and thank god these bands turned me onto it but then there's bands like like the bad brains that got mm -hmm. me thinking about yeah. me, like what is rastafarianism right like and you look into that a little bit and you're like damn that is that so speaks to what i'm already doing i'm pothead vegan <laughs> fucking listening to music honoring right, right. spirits like um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that, um, that saved my life and I think, um, is a good channel for, for some feelings that really have nowhere else to go at that age. So it, and it's interesting with HR from Bad Brains, yeah. who I really love, he speaks so beautifully and ingenuously about what it was like for him as a teenager to discover the book Think and Grow Rich. And Think and Grow Rich is supposed to be one of these books that we're embarrassed to be seen reading on the subway, you know, put something else over it. <laughs> and, you know, you think I'm reading this shit, you know? And, yeah. um, and, and he had the same, I, I had the same reaction to it that he did, where it, it, he used it, he saw it as a book that helps you to concretize ideas. And that's one of these books that has become perennial 
and yet it can never be digested. You know, all the academics and all the journalists want to piss on it because they think, oh, that's just this bullshit positive thinking tradition in American life that we hate and that hypnotizes the sheep. And as if, how would they even know? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. how would they know? And they <clears throat> can't categorize the book, so they turn it into a sort of a, a kind of epithet. And when I was like reading HR, talking about it, I was so moved by it because it, it worked the same illumination on me, I suppose, mm. you know, that it, that it did on him. And it just meant so much to me that this material didn't need to be processed through beige colors, you know, <laughs> that there was yeah. a different way of approaching this material. And uh, it meant the world to me, it just mm. meant the world to me. Didn't feel like I had to join something or give up something to be into that kind of literature. Wow. Yeah, yeah when, when I think of, um, and, and this is a, a thing I've been thinking about a lot because of our new project, Wild Magic, when I think of American mystics, like the, the, he's one of the first people that comes into my head. I think of, I mean, and, and look, I might be way off on this assessment, but I think of HR, I think of Rocky Erickson, hmm. I think of David Lynch. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, these are the people that I feel like are, have really carried the torch in some way. Absolutely. And, you know, um, there's probably a lot of other names that you can add to that, but those are the people that immediately come to mind. Um, I was wondering what you think about the American occult or, or mystical tradition and where it began and who are those, who are the big figures for you? Well, the thing that I always loved about the occult in America is that it had a very do-it-yourself quality to it. Mm -hmm. And... I'm working on a new book, which we were talking about before, called Modern Occultism. And one of the difficulties for me, which I've now gotten past, but a difficulty that I faced in writing that book is, I do not relate well to some of the high liturgical ceremonial magic like that, which was practiced by the Golden Dawn, for example. I love their aesthetic, and I appreciate what they were trying to accomplish, but there was so much gatekeeping and attention to hierarchy and initiatory badges and names, the grand imperator of this, and some groups still practice this today. And it leaves me completely cold. You know, I want to yeah. do magic with a hammer. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, yeah. wait to get my degree in nine months <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And, and whereas in the U.S., there was a more of a homegrown do-it-yourself quality. So like I think of like the black tradition of hoodoo, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through several years where I was very, very dedicated to hoodoo, and I, I still am, but it was a period of time of, of an intense exploration. And this magical system was devised by people who were just surviving day to day and they could lay their hands on certain household objects like pins or soaps or botanical items or things of that nature and and it's powerful it's powerful and it works and I loved that it had no boundaries because they couldn't afford to have boundaries yeah. I, I, there was no system and 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 there was like an anarchic quality to it and I, I find that that repeats in a lot of American magic. And I go cold when people try to import, as I see it, um, the European practices of rank and badge and sash and this and that. And I love Freemasonry, and there's a lot of people in Masonry who I love. And that path absolutely has a place and has brought to meaning in people's lives. Um, but I'm not one for memorization, and mm. that probably emerged from my youth because, you know, growing up in a traditional Jewish background and prepping for that, there's a beauty to it, but there's also, it's very, very rote, and, mm. you know, uh, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I went through it. It left me with certain things. But it wasn't what I wanted to take fully into adulthood, I mm. discovered. So I always dig that um, a lot of American occultists, they, they came from pretty ordinary circumstances and they never ran from that. Like mm. I dig Andrew Jackson Davis, for example, who was a guy who lived in the Hudson Valley and in the 1840s, the American press started calling him the Poughkeepsie seer, as if to make fun of him, uh -huh. like you know, the, the prophet of Poughkeepsie. <laughs> but he very rightly embraced it 
and started calling himself the Poughkeepsie Seer. And people were enormously turned on by his ideas, I think to some degree because he and other people like him held out the promise that piercing the veil may not require the man with the robes and the candles and the bells and the incense. It may be possible just to do this at your kitchen table. And that's what turned on the people who started experimenting with the talking board, which we later came to call the Ouija board or, really? you know, mm -hmm. people, yeah, it, the first drawings of what we recognize as a Ouija board came out of Northern Ohio in the late 1870s. What? You know, For yeah, what? I had no yeah. idea. Yeah, people were just grooving to like <laughs> this kitchen table mysticism, wow. and I was very excited by all that. And I, I, I believe in it, and I remember it from my childhood, and it was so exciting to me. And I, I like even today. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of, of, of accelerance. You know, I don't like when people are told there's no shortcut because it's like, well, how do you know there's no shortcut? You know, <laughs> I recognize that, that that has a commonsensical sheen to it, but does one really know? Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe you should, you should try. And uh, maybe for some people, a, a shortcut comes in the forms of psychedelics or maybe a shortcut comes in the form of some... Uh, experience of awareness you know just facing reality squarely yeah and or it, maybe it doesn't come you know mm -hmm. but to take that off the table seems to me a mistake yeah it could be remarkable you know i would like to take this opportunity to see if i can deal with whatever that hum is do you oh. hear the hum i'm okay. sorry just one oh, that's second. okay one second i just if there is something that oh yeah, there's a hum. I don't think it'll be that noticeable when I finally when I mix okay. it and everything. Sometimes it's just feedback on the monitors. Okay, cool. Sorry. Not at all. I just wanted to. Find Damn, I thought out. you were about to say something really profound. Right. No, I know. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> like, like, oh. um, <laughs> no, I didn't want to throw it for a loop, but I wanted to find a natural break to see if there was something that yeah, I could do. Yeah, I appreciate okay. that. Cool. Um, so, what were we just saying? talking about the Ouija board and so what was this guy up to what was he doing that even you know gained him notoriety it was oh a, Andrew yeah okay <clears throat> um he was a kid growing up in Poughkeepsie 17 years old and uh, a local mesmerist blew into town and he tried to put Andrew into a trance and it didn't work out very well and then the next day a local tailor said to him you know I'm I'm dabbling in this mesmerism stuff too. You want to come by my house tonight? I'll attempt it. And so uh, he did. And this time Andrew went into a very, very deep trance. And he he saw himself standing in the dark on this uh, seashore. And he felt like he was awaiting some kind of a message. And, and then Andrew started working with the local tailor, whose name was Levingston. And he began to go into trances almost every night with this guy and he would come out of the trances and he would write down what he had seen and he starts to assemble this whole volume of metaphysical lectures and it was really interesting because at the time the, the country was pretty well dominated probably by Calvinist Protestantism and the idea was um, if you don't belong to church X, you're going to hell and Andrew without directly challenging any of that would say well he he referred to the afterlife as Summerland, which is, Ooh. yeah. I like that. <laughs> and that's a practice I've continued, and I realize nobody knows what the fuck I'm talking about. I'll be like, so has Grandma gone to Summerland? And everybody will be like, fuck are you saying? But, but I've always liked it. And so he referenced it as Summerland, and he said, you know, in Summerland, um, you meet Catholics and Jews and, 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 and different uh, people from different tribes and customs all around the world. So without ever uttering a radical word, he totally undermined the concept that so-called salvation was available through only one church. And the American spiritualists, the people who were interested in seances and talking to the dead, they had a way about them of doing this where they wouldn't say like, fuck religion or, you know, fuck your church. They would talk about their experiences and that in itself was undermining of some of the calcified ideas that there's only one road to Summerland. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was fascinated to learn when I was writing Occult America was that most trans mediums were women. And that wasn't accidental because 
a woman who wanted a voice in the civic or spiritual or religious culture could go into spiritualism and find it. And people were looking to these figures as religious th authorities of a certain sort. So you have the trans medium who's maybe channeling a voice or something at the table, and suddenly there's this opening of authority for women in religious situations and it, it changed the culture it started wow. changing the culture and it's it's wild you know so it, it's funny because sometimes people think of the occult as being this secretive star chamber filled with guys in black robes and yeah well it was also filled with a lot of radicals and suffragists and abolitionists and people who were like fuck this is this is we're getting down to the bones of truth here and mm. mesmer himself back in france he he blew into France um, in the late uh, into Paris in the late 1770s, and he never uttered a political word. But there was a political undertone to everything he did because the idea was that okay, if you can place somebody into a trance and get down to whatever their essential self is, and everybody seems to be susceptible to this trance state, whether it's an aristocrat, whether it's a working person, whether it's a slave on a sugar plantation in the West Indies, suddenly you're undermining the whole idea that rank and privilege and social position is who we are. There's this undercurrent of actuality that's really there. So although Mesmer never directly aligned himself with revolutionaries, there were revolutionaries who really dug his ideas because they felt like, this guy is signaling that there's actually an essential basic unity to humanity. Mm. And in its way, it was very undermining. So you find that, you know, in the occult frequently. Wow. And, it, and is there something um, to uh, American occultism that has to do with this being a new country and there's new values and the types of people that were coming here and almost like a starting from scratch thing. Yes. And I've always noticed that wherever you see flows of migration, that's where the new religious movements appear. Mm. So like in upstate New York, for example, is an area called the Burned Over District, which I write about a lot. That had been home uh, to the Iroquois nation. And some of the members of the Iroquois Federation uh, made a military alliance with the British uh, during the War of Independence. And so after the war settled, the colonial government used that as a pretext to what it had wanted to do for a long time, which was to push the Iroquois off that land, mm. very rich, very fertile farmland. So a whole bunch of New Englanders flowed into that space, and suddenly it becomes ground zero for new religious movements. So it's the birthplace of, of spiritualism, of American variants of mesmerism, of Seventh-day Adventism, of Mormonism, later on of suffragism, later on America's first utopian experiments. And that's the damning contradiction of this country that you have this, this civilization of people who have lived there for centuries and centuries and centuries and they're, they're pushed out and it's this mm. horrible violation. And at the same time, inflow these relatively liberal New Englanders and they're founding all these radical new religious movements and they are taking root on soil that belonged to somebody else. And it's a very damning contradiction, but oh, you got to live with it. That's, yeah. that's this country's shadow. Yeah. And, you know, you have to live with it and you have to know, yeah, both these things were going on simultaneously. And this is the late 1800s? Uh, early 1800s. Early 1800s. Yeah. And it was crazy. I mean, a lot of radical movements took root there. And... In many respects, central New York State was settled by radical religious movements. The Shakers, there was a, a woman from Rhode Island who called herself the public universal friend, and she was a, basically a, a spirit a channeler. That. Yeah, <laughs> and her house is still, is still up there. Uh, her followers built a, a mansion for her in the town of Jerusalem in central New York. They named it Jerusalem. I just visited this past spring. It's a privately occupied house. There are kids riding bikes around and they're like, you know, who's this fucking weirdo staring at our house? But um, I, I visited the house and and it's very moving because uh, her name was Jemima Wilkinson. And she, during the Revolutionary War, had typhus fever. And she slipped into a coma and her family thought, well, she's a goner. And then one day during the death vigil at her bed, Jemima just springs up and she's all 
ruddy and bright and energetic, and she announces to her family, the woman you know as Jemima has died, and I am an incarnation of the spirit, and I'll only answer to the name Public Universal Friend. And so she assembled a religious movement, Damn. and her followers wanted to start up their own community, similar to what they witnessed among the Shakers, for example. And so they flowed into central New York because that's where the cheap land was. Mm. And and they settled the damn region. I mean, they really settled the region. Wow. And it's just incredible. And yet, you know, the reason they were able to go there is because these indigenous people were expelled. Mm. And it's like, yeah, folks, here's the cheap land. So again, it's a radicalism, but it's a radicalism built on tears. You know, yeah. You have, the, you have both. And we're still in that situation now. Yeah. And it, it's crazy that you fast forward 200 years to... Um, people doing this in a fake way now you mm -hmm. know like, like we started to talk about that a little bit before and i think i think that was really interesting it was almost a relief to me that you came in here talking about that like oh there's a lot of bullshitters out there yeah in this, <laughs> in this spiritual community a lot of people yeah. saying that they're doing stuff that they're not oh yeah and it's crazy to think about that that's just been like a 200 year evolution from it being this like underground thing like that no one had really even heard of to now it's like people stake claim to and build their whole identity around it even if they're not really feeling those things and 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 think how much more it would mean to the exchange around spirituality around people just looking for good ways to live if a well-known spiritual figure would just come right out and say yeah i'm a total fuck up i get angry all the time i yeah. wrestle with rage i put this that and it's all there mm. and i know it's there because I worked in publishing for many years and I got to see how the sausages are made and it ain't pretty, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I would see people who, you know, called themselves spiritual activists or I haven't missed a day of meditation in 30 years as if that's some sort of badge of honor. Yeah, yeah. But then they would like, you know, tear someone a new asshole for the smallest infraction. Mm. And what I would love to see is the conversation that says, yes, I haven't missed a meditation for 30 years. And I just teared someone a new asshole for no really good reason. Yeah. And I just egregiously disrespected somebody. Mm. And it's like, okay, now we can begin. Now we can begin. And we realize the massiveness of the barriers facing us, how broken human nature really is. Because mm. I do all this stuff too. And I have wrestled all my life with anger issues and my biggest regret in life, maybe my only regret, is that when my children were young, I d displayed outbursts of anger to them. And I feel horrible about that. And I've spent the rest of my life trying to renegotiate that, you know, in myself and with others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's with all the years of spiritual study and meditation and this that and the other thing and going to all the weekend seminars mm -hmm. and this is general this is a general problem yeah so what i want is an exchange in the spiritual culture that's hardcore honest mm. and if a person's meditating for 30 years and he or she freaks out over some minor shit then that, that's valuable. It doesn't mean that, oh, well, they're a bad person or whatever. They might be, but it's a general problem. And so if, if, if that problem isn't solved by 30 years of practice, then that starts to tell us something about the barriers facing us. Maybe it tells us what we should and shouldn't be doing, you know. Or something about the human condition and yeah. that it is a, a balance of light and dark and it feels like, this could give a wide, if it, uh, individual acknowledgement, everyone would have a wider berth for a pathway to forgiveness because it's like, yes, that's, you did something impure and that's a part of me too, because I do impure things, even if I meditate and do all these things. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's partly, I think like, uh, if you listen to all 290 episodes of this podcast, that would be the thesis that comes up. It's like, we're, we're doing our best. We consider ourselves spiritual. We had a big awakening and yeah, we have been meditating for 10 years, but mainly what this podcast is about is our downfalls and talking about how we navigate them and how we've gotten better at navigate that, navigating them and forgiving the versions of ourselves that had the outbursts, that mm -hmm. did the really unsavory things that blew up at people. And 
like to me that's that's uh that would be valuable if we if we had a voice to turn to like that so that's why we try to put it out there because being honest about it has helped me confront stuff that I think if I weren't honest on here about it I wouldn't be honest with myself about and then like I don't know if you if you can't fucking see the territory how are you going to go dealing with it yeah yeah and I always want people to feel every option is available to them because within the so-called alternative spiritual scene we also get into these orthodoxies about what a person should and shouldn't be doing and it could be that for a certain individual something that might on the surface appear financial or cosmetic or whatever that could actually be an incredibly valuable solution for that individual and i want people to feel free to avail themselves of of such things um there was a shrink on twitter about a year ago who made a statement that i really appreciated and she said i i believe in the benefits of therapy but i have to say um at least 70 percent of the people who come to me just have the problem of needing more money and i was like <laughs> right on yeah i'm I so glad people would say that yeah yeah and i'm so glad and the thing went viral and a lot of people appreciated it and of course a lot of people pushed back with all their you know sweet quotations about uh you know, problems are solved from within. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> and I just really appreciated that because sometimes people are set on this path of searching for some antecedent as to why they're suffering. It could be why they're suffering is that they don't have enough money or right. that they there's some aspect of their life they don't feel good about. Like we were, you were talking about Henry Rollins. You know, Henry spoke and wrote about how bodybuilding made such a difference in his life. And I greatly respect that. You know, I mm. greatly respect that. He felt that he had his hands on the controls finally, and it did a whole variety of things for him. And I just don't want people to feel that their options are, are limited. Mm. Yeah, so how do you rectify, like you wrote a book, Secrets of Mastery, and you're a scholar of Neville Goddard, and how do you rectify, or I don't know if that's the right word, but knowing that our imagination creates our reality, but then not necessarily putting the onus on where people are at or just being like, well, you could just imagine better. You're not imagining good enough. Yeah, you know, yeah. like how does, how do like, how do we've, you do? I think we've been privy to some gross misinterpretations of Neville Goddard and like some really condescending attitudes around it. Oh, have the, you ever heard? Of that absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I there are people out there who uh, given the chance tomorrow would start a church of Neville Goddard yeah. and, 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 and I'd be the first one expelled, you know, <laughs> and right. he's into what, you know, and you know, <laughs> Neville says, don't pay attention to tarot or astrology. You know, I love Neville and Neville was a beautiful, beautiful man with incredible, incredibly powerful ideas. I, I assembled an anthology of Neville's final lectures, and I was determined to write about the circumstances of Neville's death. And finally, I was able to lay my hands on his death certificate. And he died of alcohol-related causes, most likely. Wow. He had cirrhosis of the liver and the esophageal veins uh, um, uh, leading you know down to his digestive system uh, had burst which is why he bled out essentially at the time of his death wow. something that was known but the cause was never understood and so people have said to me do you think less of him and the answer is absolutely not you know people we all have friction in our lives we all have friction in our lives and now, <clears throat> I can't speak authoritatively about Neville's medical situation any more than I could anybody else's. Uh, you know, he may not have been drinking heavily at that time in his life. There might have been something genetic going on. He, his system might have been especially sensitive to alcohol. Mm -hmm. But he did acknowledge that he drank a bottle of wine each day with lunch, which is fine with me. But he clearly, you know, there is a, it's a pattern. It's a, it's a medication. It's, it's a medication. Yeah. And I do it too. You know, I mean, I'm sitting here vaping and, you know, if you yeah. offered me Jack Daniels, I <laughs> probably wouldn't refuse. I was drinking Jack Daniels. We were talking about this on an interview yesterday <laughs> and it's going to be on fucking Showtime. And people, Horror, it's the fucking drunk. And it's like, what you don't know is it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, but they offered and um, <clears throat> I, 
I don't view him lesser for it. I, I view him as more of a human being. Mm. Alan Watts, great. Alan Watts. Yeah, man. that's what I, I was thinking I love the man. Of. I love the man. You know, he, he, he died of a similar condition. And people have stress and friction in their lives. And the sooner that we get down to business of acknowledging that, the better for everybody. I mean, we just can't hide from these things. Neville had beautiful ideas. And I think Neville's ideas have ultimate truth. I do think there are also a lot of intervening factors and forces, which is why I don't groove to people saying like, oh, you're just not imagining right. And it's like, wait a minute, cowboy. Like, there's a lot of shit going down in this dynamic world in which we live. And, you know, the people in the Philippines are not suffering from a monsoon because they have bad vibes. <laughs> you know, they're suffering from a monsoon for reasons that a meteorologist could explain. Yeah. And <laughs> and I think we, we have to groove to the fact that we live under a, a vast complexity, or I should say we experience a vast complexity of, of laws and forces. And we also have to groove to the fact that the positive mind tradition, and I define it very broadly, it took root in America because, to a very great extent, a lot of people in this country um, have material circumstances that allow them to move through life with a reasonable degree of confidence, which you don't have if you're caught in the middle of a civil war in Syria or, or in Yemen. Right. Right. And, and, and one has to be down with that. And I feel very, very strongly that another person's experience can't be described by somebody who hasn't been through it. You know, mm -hmm. I haven't been through war, so I'm not going to say like, well, this is why this is happening in Ukraine because, yeah. you know, they've got bad vibes and it's like, <laughs> how the fuck do I know? Yeah. I mean, they're suffering. Yeah, when I went to Rwanda, they like literally believed because of missionaries that they had the devil there and that's why there was that genocide and everything and that, you know, and that I as a white person from America like had God on my side and I was like, whoa, this is very twisted. That's that's terrible. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's that that was the belief that the missionaries had yeah, left and, them with. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's um I think people can get very I think it's more about like why are we here? And I think we're here because it's like an education. It's a, a burning of attachments and all this stuff. It's not necessarily about like, hey, can you imagine twenty thousand dollars in your bank account this weekend or whatever it is? Like, there's a balance of like thinking positive. I guess that's what I'm trying to navigate myself is like navigating wanting to speak good things into fruition. You mm -hmm. know, like how I'm talking about our upcoming projects is like as if they're happening. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not trying to curse myself or bet against myself, but I also try to not find myself in the trap of like, oh wait, I had a bad thought or oh I didn't have good enough thoughts and it's it starts like this, to get into superstitious it's like, territory. It's, yeah, there's yeah. this balance that I feel like I'm always like a tightrope that I'm always navigating. But then sometimes I'll go to bed and I'll just imagine and imagine and imagine. And then I wake up with an email that someone's like, hey, like we want to give you this job. It, and I'm like, works. oh my God, it, it works. It, you know? And, and, <laughs> and in my estimation, it, it, it does work. Yeah. But life is very complex. There are a lot of intervals. There's a lot of messy shit yeah. that we have to deal with. And sometimes what works can occur over an arc of a long, long stretch of years or decades. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've had this experience, and I was saying this, frankly, to a podcaster the other day. And, I mean, it's slightly embarrassing in a certain way, but if we're here to tell the truth, yeah. um, when I was a kid, uh, Jesse Jackson spoke, I think it was in 1984, at the Democratic National Convention. And I was so thrilled with his speaking style and watching it on television. And I cried, and I was like... I thought it was just one of the most thrilling pieces of oratory I've ever seen in my life. And a vinyl record was put out of this. So at home, when I was wow. alone, where I spent a lot of time, <laughs> and I still do, um, I put on the vinyl record, and I would sit in front of a mirror, and I would mouth uh, Jesse's uh, speaking style. I was like, I want to speak like this. Cool. I want to speak like this. And it dawned on me during the pandemic that 90% of what I'm doing when I'm not writing uh, is I'm staring into a Zoom screen and speaking as though looking into that mirror. Mm -hmm. And the congruity was startling. And at that time, I guess I was around 18 years old or something like that. It was a long time ago. I'm now 57. And I realized that I'm doing that. And there's a lot of things like that that have occurred in life. And 
one could, of course, apply that brutal term confirmation bias to it, which mm -hmm. is just a social sciences term for prejudice. It's very overused. But the fact is, it's very difficult to measure the emotional stakes that the individual has in a certain situation. And once you start to get into your innermost feelings, the alignment goes off the actuarial charts. Mm -hmm. And I, I do believe, mm. I do believe that it works. Um, let me just make sure no one's getting arrested. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. That's okay. It's a spam risk, but dig this from Poughkeepsie, New York. No See, way. boys and girls, no, okay. it's all real. <laughs> Let's answer it. Maybe it's Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm in Summerland. <laughs> but isn't that freaky? You know? that, that's that, crazy. That why is am crazy. I getting a spam call from Poughkeepsie, not known as the spam capital of the world? No, we need these cosmic wings. The Four of these happened today before you even got right, here. Right, right, right. I was like, what the hell is going from Tampa. On? You know, like, yeah. why is this happening? <laughs> um, but I do believe it works, or I wouldn't dedicate myself to it. Right. And I also, what I really love, and this is why it must not be brutalized by people saying, you're not imagining right, it gives you articles of experiment. And I love that. You know, and I think you mm. guys experience that with psychedelics, for example. Yeah. It's an article of experiment. And that's wonderful. And I get very attached to very basic, simple ideas, because my conviction is that a simple idea applied with passion can be this, it may be the only pivot point of an individual's life that is idea-based. Because 99% of the time, people are just not going to do stuff. They're simply not going to do it. Yeah. And they, it's funny, Krishnamurti um, had this wonderful encounter um, in a classroom with some Indian teenagers. And one of the kids said to him, you know, you're, you're telling us to live independently. You're telling us to do all these things, but how, how? And Krishnamurti said, with total respect, when you ask how, it means you don't really want to do it. Because the fact is, if you were walking down the road and there was a cobra on that road in front of you, you wouldn't be like, well, how do I get away from this cobra? You'd know how to get away yeah. from this cobra. <laughs> yeah. And he said, when you want to play cricket, you don't ask yourself, Ooh, how do I play cricket? You sneak out of your house. You skip doing your homework. You trick your mom and dad. You find ways to do cricket. Yeah. You never once ask yourself how. And I think ideas that are really actionable, meaningful, that a person wants to do, he or she doesn't ask how because you're you're hungry for it. You're mm -hmm. hungry for it. And even if you fuck it up, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. You know, people maybe are interested in a certain romantic partner and they try to flirt with that person. They're like, oh, I fucked it up. <laughs> but never is their integrity in question. They know what they want. So if the individual knows what he or she wants, the how tends to recede. And I love these articles of experimentation because they, they offer you a thing to try. And if you like it, persist in it. And if you don't like it, keep walking. Mm. But you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to join right. anything. So I really groove to very, very simple ideas. So mm. what would be the simplest way to communicate maybe Neville Goddard's practices if someone was like, oh, I want to start dabbling in his technique? Is there a way to talk about that briefly? Yeah. In three words, Neville believed your um, <clears throat> imagination, I'll, I'll say it. Imagination is God. Imagination is God. I don't use that kind of language myself, but Neville's uh, core idea is that everything that you see and experience are your emotionalized thoughts outpictured into the world. And he was an extreme idealist in that sense. And he would insist, and this is what I loved about Neville, he would say to people, Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Go home. Do it tonight. If it doesn't work, forget you ever heard my name. Mm -hmm. But if you're bold enough to challenge me, I have no doubt of what you'll find. And I love the radical simplicity of Neville's ideas. Mm -hmm. And he believed that scripture is a book of Near Eastern symbolism that represents your imagination as the creative force called God. And to follow Neville's teaching... Um, <clears throat> there's no Mitch here. There's no Sean or Cass here. The listener is the creator, and the listener is hearing these ideas simply because he or she was interested in them at this given moment. Uh, yeah. We're just figments of you. you know? I've had this experience enough. The first time I did acid, 300 micrograms, I was like, 
reading a book and I was like, oh, the, the words are unwritten until I turn the page. And it was just like this, just knowing. I just knew that the book was unwritten until I turned the page because I'm like an active player yes. in this. Yes. I, I think Erwin Schrodinger, the physicist, would probably say, you're right. Far out. I wish I could get my graduate students to finally grok to that idea, you yeah. know? I think they just, <laughs> they, there was something recently that came out with this about like quantum mechanics or quantum physics where it's like because of the observed universe or I'm not going to say this well, but basically there's scientific proof that's saying exactly what we're saying. Absolutely. And, and a thing that I've noticed is uh, many years ago, there was a movie, a movie that came out called What the Bleep, and it was about how quantum physics translates into day-to-day -day life. And everybody lined up to piss on it. Yeah. Here go the New Agers <laughs> again, cherry-picking these ideas and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And since that movie came out, which I assume was about 20 years ago, a lot of the pissing on the New Age interpretation of quantum theory has stopped yeah. because actually the New Agers were right. Mm -hmm. The New Agers were right. And... These were the implications that the founders of quantum theory held themselves. And I always say to people, if you think that sounds far out, if you think I'm just flag waving, go get yourself a subscription to Scientific American magazine, that fount of occult passions. And you'll find out the shit I'm saying is conservative. Mm -hmm. You know, compared to the discussions that are going on among theoretical quantum physicists and mechanical physicists, what I'm saying is conservative. The implications mm -hmm. of quantum physics are that exactly what your perception was is correct that we live in a perceptual based world and it's very possible that at every instant of life we're recreating or i would say selecting our whole concept of so-called past present future if you ask somebody where did you grow up well i grew up in queens and my mother's name was this and my dad did this and blah 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 blah, blah. it's so palpably real it's as real as the floor beneath our feet yeah but it could be that at every instant of existence, we are selecting a comprehensive sense of so-called past, present, future. We know that time is conceptual. We know that time bends under certain circumstances. So linearity itself, it may be a necessary illusion for us to navigate through life, but it's no more than that. So it could be we're creating something at every instant. It yeah. feels like a huge burden of responsibility. You it know, does. having this power to like that your thoughts create reality or imagination creates reality. And you're like, whoa, I really got to keep that in check. You know, well, we exactly. put it into practice every time we make a movie. Like if, if what you're saying, if when you're reading the book, the, the, the rest of the pages don't even exist till you're turning the page. The same thing's happening when we show up in a Walgreens parking lot uh, and say, like, OK, who the fuck are we going to interview now? And all of a sudden, the characters that we couldn't even that we couldn't even imagine, but we did actually. But it's start showing up, right? And they're right, the right. perfect people, and they say the perfect thing. But they're showing up not even because of us, but because of someone who's watching this movie ten months from now <laughs> needs to hear something. Because if time is this illusion, we weren't we. Everything's happening at once, I guess, is the theory. So when they're like going through their day and they have this thought, and then they have a synchronicity with something that's said in the movie, that's kind of like co-happening. I don't know. Well, listen, it's real, you know, and, and to take it down to the most basic level. Okay, so in our own era, astronauts, okay, if you are moving at or near light speed, the aging process, time slows down, uh, not for the observer, but for the individual who's like, you know, or rather, how can I put this? Um, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to frame this differently. The... The individual who's moving at or near light speed experiences normalcy. It's not like he's going, whoa, everything slows down. The observer experiences that. But it's, it's actual. It's actual for the observer. And when you re-enter the non-time velocity realm, you're like, fuck did everyone go? You know, you're Rip Van Winkle. And this is not theoretical. In our own era, astronauts who are moving nowhere near the velocity of light speed, they do experience minute reductions in the aging process. Minute, but measurable, but actual. And it's like, Einstein was fucking right. Mm. Time is conditional. And time bends in conditions of ex extreme speed, uh, extreme gravity. And there's um, a cognitive uh, psychologist at Cornell named Daryl Bem, who I've been writing about a lot lately, he conducted experiments into precognition. And in short, his takeaway was, there are cognitive improvements 
to your performance based on what you do in the future. And he tested for this by using memorization of word lists. So he asked somebody, memorize this list of 10 words. Okay, you done? How many do you remember? Well, you know, on average, people remember five, six, what have you. He found that if people then perform the same exercise and they different word list, and then they memorized it after the fact, after the test, their scores spiked slightly, mm -hmm. slightly, but again and again over thousands of trials. And it's been 10 years since Ben published his research. So his stuff has been meta-analyzed and it proved confirmatory in a meta-analysis involving 90 experiments in 33 different labs in 14 different nations. And the professional skeptics always say, oh, you know, ESP experiments can't be replicated, and you will read that on Wikipedia. And, you know, <laughs> the listeners are invited to look it up on Wikipedia right now. <laughs> Test me, <laughs> as Neville would say. And, of course, they, they have proven replicable. But the professional skeptics have also themselves been very successful at interjecting their beliefs into reference sources and media. So that's that. So I, I'm very interested in Bem and his work. And several weeks ago, <clears throat> there was a Muay Thai fighter, Thai kickboxing, who came to me and he said, I got a match in nine days, championship match, and I'm feeling nervous and I'd like your help with my mental game. And so I gave him this exercise called the 30-day mental challenge. Again, super simple, super simple. And he said, well, I dig this, but do you have something more short term? And I was like, well, my man, try this because... If BEM's experiments are correct, that what you do in the future can improve your cognition and I presume your physical performance uh, in the present. So he did it. Uh, he won the match. He came out. I, I saw him. It's up on YouTube. Uh, his name is Spencer Hadley, and he is great. He came out, and he was so relaxed. He was so relaxed. And for his entry music... Um, you know, most fighters come in playing like this ear bleeding heavy metal yeah, or, yeah. you know, and he came into that Belinda Carlisle song, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Oh, I love and, that song. Isn't what? it great? I'm yeah. surprised he knows that. Right. And one of the announcers says, I love it. He's coming into Belinda Carlisle. And, you know, he won and he deserved to win. I mean, he's a great fighter and he trained hard, but he certainly felt like the exercise had helped him. So this is what I mean when I say articles of experiment. You know, it's so simple and yet it can tap into these wild ideas that are almost unfathomable to us. You know, the idea of precognition, it sounds so crystal ball, like, what the fuck are you talking yeah. about? And yet, it could be argued these are logical imperatives that come out of our scientific understanding because we know that time is conditional. And if we know that, uh, that opens up incredible vistas. You know? well, what, well, what about remote viewing? Yeah, same deal, right. It's anomalous transfers of information, and it could be that the psyche is capable of, let's say, moving among different intersections of time. Mm. I mean, we're making decisions all the time to observe things, to bring our perspective to things. Well, in particle physics, and it's starting to move to larger, more macro objects above the particle stage, but in particle physics classical premise is something isn't localized until it's been measured. It's there, but only in potential. So you have things in a so-called wave state or a state of superposition. It's infinity. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was a little kid thinking to myself, how can there be such a thing as infinity? Because we're not really built to experience it. Right. I mean, we need linearity to yeah. get through life, but that doesn't mean it's the ultimate name of the game. And so there is infinitude within the particle realm, and we're starting to do these experiments more on macro objects like hydrogen molecules, and actuality, locality, as we experience it, occurs only uh, with measurement. So when you were having the experience of reading that book, that could be defined, could be, as a kind of measurement, as a kind of measurement. And the founders of quantum theory were all perceptually based. They all believed in a perceptually based universe. And no one questions any of this data. Like all the data that I'm describing goes back to the 1930s. 
It's the implications of the data that remain so radical. Mm, totally. Yeah, yeah, and how to even wrap your head around it. How like to wrap your head around it. Yeah. Well, because it does open up the can of worms of infinity. I, I remember we saw this movie, uh, Third Eye Spies. You ever see that documentary? No. It's cool. It just it compiles all the stuff about remote viewing and what the CIA and FBI were doing. And yeah. All the tests and how, how they basically proved it. And they don't want this information getting out there. Right. And I remember like watching it and it's like my consciousness was cracking throughout. Like, wow, this is real. There's tons of evidence. But in the days and months to follow, it was it was really like a consciousness shifting type of movie because I'm like, OK, well, if that's possible, it just leaves everything like yeah. everything that I once wrote off to make myself feel more comfortable in this experience is actually now on the table. Yeah. And like Cass is saying, it's weird. Cause I think that for some people it would have the effect of, Oh, nothing matters, but I'm, I'm in Cass's like, I'm like, wait, everything matters. It really matters. The way you conduct yourself, the vibration you're putting out, all this stuff is, uh, it's, it's extremely consequential. So, um, yeah, you got to figure out how to get your shit together. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's, um, there's such a fascinating wager or gambit in it all because if it follows that what we consider past, present, future is all this nonlinear complexity of what might be called different dimensions or different intersections of time, then it does stand to reason that nothing is absolutely fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, Gurdjieff used to say... Um, the past controls the future, but the present controls the past. And that's an interesting thing to live with for a mm -hmm. while. It's an interesting thing to live with. Yeah. We could do a podcast where we just say that at the beginning and then just sit here in silence the rest of the time. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be great. Just you know? really think about that one. <laughs> right. You know, really live with it. It's, it's intense. Yeah. It is intense, but it is liberating too yes because it's on you and every moment's a new moment and a new opportunity to rewrite your story in yeah. a way that's you're very powerful like this you might think that you're a victim of your story when you're really the co-creator of your story well and there's so much in that i'm sorry go ahead well it, i mean it leads me actually to the next question which people on the discord are, are discord patreon.com slash church to chill if you want to join it um we're asking us to ask you your thoughts about um the mainstreaming and legalization of psychedelics and what do you think the implications of that will be? Well, I'm excited about it, but I'm also realistic about it. And I realize that as legislation is moving its way through different state legislators, legislatures, obviously some of this legislation is getting written by lobbyists, by pharma yeah. companies mm -hmm. who are like, well, we want a piece of this. You know, yeah. totally. it's not just some poor guy named Mike who's up in his office all night. <laughs> like, well, what should we do? <laughs> you know, he's getting handed this and. So I'm very excited about it. And look, you know, commerce is a fact of life. So, it, yeah, probably to some extent, Big Pharma is going to have a, a hand in it. And, and that's the way it is. But I'm very excited for it. I mean, I want to see anything that opens up the individual to new possibilities. Yeah. Listen, I'm very happy with the legalization of weed, you know, here in New York City. And I'm glad mm -hmm. that I can buy weed at my vape store and, and, and so forth. It, it is a big help to me. Yeah. And, and, and I... I think that, the first of all, the vast majority of the public, whether it matters or not, wants this stuff to be legal. It seems to be the one political issue that everybody agrees upon. Mm. And so I'm asking myself, well, this is bullshit. I mean, who's saying that it's illegal to grow a mushroom in your backyard and give it to your neighbor or sell it to your right. neighbor if you wish? Yeah. And uh, I'm excited by it. You know, I want people to have these opportunities to experience different frames of mind. It's also a reason why I won't engage in the popular pissing on uh, the book and movie The Secret, for example. And mm. I feel like that's gotten really old. Mm. I have my differences with Rhonda Byrne, and I have very serious differences, and I've written about them. And I'm happy to speak about them, and I'd be happy to speak with Rhonda about them. But I dig the fact that what she did got people to think about different ways of using their minds. Mm. And I have never personally, and I've been at this for a long time, <laughs> I've never witnessed anybody who made some ruinous decision financially or otherwise because of the secret. And everybody talks about, <laughs> oh, well, should a Mercedes Benz really be the end of all spiritual practice? There's no Mercedes Benz in the movie. Yeah, it yeah. never happened. <laughs> and and, and I, I actually look back on that. And I think that opened up a lot of people to maybe picking up a copy of Think and Grow Rich or whatever and raising questions about how they could use their minds. Mm. And when 
journalists make reference to this mass delusion around this movie, I have a challenge for that because what is a delusion uh, if you can't see it in conduct? Unless somebody engages in some depleting, ruinous behavior, where is this delusion that you're referring to? It's just a just subjective belief. Mm. It's like saying chocolate ice cream is bad because I prefer vanilla. Mm-hmm. It's senseless, you yeah. know. And not participating in the lives of people who responded to that movie, they have very little way of knowing that, at least in my personal experience, and, and I hope I speak from years Uh, I've never encountered anyone who engaged in anything ruinous because of it, but I encountered a lot of people who said, yeah, I got interested in this or I got interested in that. So it became kind of an octave. And um, I like religious novelty. You know, Mm -hmm. I think religious novelty, again, based on what we're talking about, it helps people feel like, well, maybe I could experiment with that. And they can do it in private. They don't have to join anything or signal what they're doing to anybody. And I like that. Mm. Yeah, it's another accelerant. And it's like talking about the accelerants, it reminds me of, you know, psychedelics and how, what do you think about the theory of like kind of religion and the priest class being like the only ones who could um, possess and have this knowledge? Well, I think, you know, we live in an age, it seems to me, of individual experiment. And I think for a while... There and I'm writing about this in the new book. I'll probably conclude on, on in the book on this note. For a while, there was like the age, at least speaking in modern terms, of the great teacher. So you know, Madame Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, Gurdjieff, Krishnamurti, and our era, it seems to me, is not marked by great teachers. And I asked a friend of mine, the philosopher Jacob Needleman, who recently died about this and he said well you know today we have the group and this was years ago that I asked Jerry about this and I think that that was a valuable answer and a truthful answer but I think even now we're passing to another phase where one of individual experiment I think we had the great teacher we had the group very very useful very very important and I think and that those things persist it's not that these categories are demarcated in some sharp way but I do believe we live in an age of individual experiment And I certainly feel that in my own search, and I can't imagine Mm -hmm. that my life is exceptional. And I, I, I want people, at least I suggest to people, to feel very free about that. Yeah. And and they don't need to advertise what they're doing. You know, they don't need to tell their shrink or, you know, (laughs) tell you know their best friend or something, and 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 hold their experiments open to somebody else's approbation. Uh, Because you'll you'll get their judgment, you know, and you may not want it, Mm. Uh, but just try. You know, that's kind of my slogan: is is try. Mm, I Um, love that. It's be your own shaman time. Yeah, I think so. Who could you turn to? Right. And and especially here in America, because we've been so individuated that it's it's like we've been training for this. We're ready. It's time for psychedelics to hit the mainstream. It's time for people to start experimenting and getting down with uh with death. Yeah, (laughs) I dig. And there's a lot of things happening like that, it seems to me. Like the mainstreaming of the UFO thesis is very important to me. Just going to bring this up. Yeah, and people talk about all these divisions in this country. And, you know, you get 10 people into a room and you start talking about UFOs, and those divisions pretty damn well disappear. You know, you'll have one guy who's like, it's all bullshit, swamp gas, a fly on the lens. And then you'll have like nine people who may range from like hippies to military officers who are like, oh yeah, this is some heavy shit. And suddenly everybody's agreeing. Yeah. And you know, there are these articles in this country, psychedelics is one, UFOs is one, mind power is one, you know, sort of apropos of what we were talking about, where you'll find people from different walks of life, heavy different politics, and suddenly everything just melts away and people find shit in common and yeah. that's really interesting and that's the stage what, we're at. what ruins it is when we start to put a label on it if, for if sure. we had a name for what those ufo people were called like it would be so easy to be like well i'm not one of them and now my beliefs stand firmly over here but right i i and i've seen it in my lifetime um but just ufos and people talking about it going mainstream where anyone from all walks of life has an opinion about it and i've always thought of it as like we're witnessing in real time, like a democratization of spirituality in this country. I agree. Something we can kind of all see for ourselves and make up our own opinions about, but it's bigger than us. Yeah. You know? And, uh, so it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, just, just 
I don't know. I think we all have a certain amount of religiosity in us, and we need to point it somewhere. And there's so nowhere to point it anymore. Yeah. You know, you know it's funny. I was um, I was doing this episode of Ancient Aliens, and they asked Hell me to yeah. talk about <laughs> <laughs> they asked me to talk about talismans, the history of talismans. And the interview questions include, what were the earliest talismans? And I thought, well, that's actually an interesting question because I don't know. And I'm thinking, like, maybe ancient Egypt. I'm not really sure. Well, there were talismans among the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals, really? our most ancient ancestors, going back literally millions of years. And they would use um, bear claws, uh, eagle claws. Uh, they would employ them ceremonially, like wearing them for necklaces for the hunt and things of that nature. And they also created, and this is where the rubber really hits the road, they created things that came to be called Venus figurines. I mean, that was a 19th century term, but <clears throat> they were these bulbous female forms, little statues, and uh, we have thousands of them. And they were presumed to be for uh, fertilities, you know, fertility, uh, part of fertility rites. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you can't really talk about spirituality or religion strictly in terms of conditioning because, I mean, this is millions of years ago. Yeah. These are our most ancient ancestors. And so the human species, what we call Homo sapiens, weren't even walking the earth yet. Mm. And our ancient most ancestors were crafting these Venus figurines and you have to figure, I mean, these are people for whom life and death is a very palpable experience. Their lifespan is relatively short. If they don't hunt and eat, they die. If they don't find shelter, if they don't light a fire, they die. So they have room for no extras in their lives. Yeah. And yet they are participating in things that we would recognize as, as talismans, as talismans or sacred wow. statuary. And I want to learn about that. There's so little that we know because it was so long ago. But one can't say that, oh, this is all just conditioned. It's like, well, that clearly wasn't conditioning. I mean, yeah. this was subsistence survival, and they didn't have time for anything extraneous. Yeah. And, and, and yet they were engaged in things. They weren't even the same species as, as we are, technically speaking. They were ancestors to our species. Wow. And they used implements that we would recognize. And that, to me, is incredible. That's wild. Incredible. I've never heard. I never knew it went back that far. Isn't it wild? I mean, it, it, it just, it proves to what I was just kind of trying to philosophize about a little bit. I'm like, I think that's baked into us. And like, it's baked I, I always use Cass as an example because she grew up with no religion whatsoever. I grew up Catholic. You grew up Jewish. Like that. I, I can't, I can't pull my, I can't zoom out enough to know what I would have been like. But Cass is a perfect example. Like didn't really have religiosity forced on her but took mushrooms at a certain age. And I was like, what's up, Jesus? Oh, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Pretty much. <laughs> he was like, finally, someone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, for real. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my definition of spirituality is extra physicality. Yeah. That's it. So I don't feel, the religions can be helps, and if they're helps, and if a person finds a community there, and, 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 and it, it, abets their ability to get in touch with something, great. I'll be first in line to shake their hands. Mm. But it's not for me. And I do think that these questions of extra physicality, as you said, they're baked into us. I mean, they're basic to the human situation as yeah. much as drinking, eating, and so forth. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hugely revealing because the story that gets told to us sometimes is that, oh, well, people still believe in astrology or whatever because they're credulous. And it's like, well, the Neanderthals weren't credulous. Every yeah. hour of every day was, you know, you're sleeping, you're hunting, you're eating, you're getting shelter. You're... And that also included what we would call spirituality. Wow. Couldn't have been extraneous. You know? Well, I think they were able to see the stars. They were able to have a whole different understanding and framework. And maybe we are, with our fragmented attention at this point, or this distraction of the religiosity or everything is, is leading us away from a quieter truth that you could only really hear if you quiet down, you know? And there's mm -hmm. so much static almost that oh I feel like I like to believe that they could hear things that we can't hear anymore. Oh, I definitely think that's true. And, you know, ESP research has actually helped to validate that. There was an ESP researcher in the 70s and 80s named Charles Onerton, and he died at a very young age. He died at age 46. He had had health problems his whole life. But he was amazing because 
he asked the very question that you were raising, which is what are the conditions that would abet extra physical experience? Or he was specifically studying for telepathy, what we would call mind-to-mind -mind communication. And he found that if you put people into conditions of sensory isolation, you would spike the circumstances under which you could track telepathy. He would use like a targeted system where a, a, a so-called sender would seek to transmit a message. I mean, these are all just metaphors. <laughs> we don't know what's going on, but you know, for the sake yeah. of clarity, a transmitter would seek to send one of five recognizable images to somebody in the isolation booth. And under such circumstances, the so-called guess rates would spike, and continually so, and they, they spiked more than some of the earlier classical experiments that began with J.B. Ryan uh, at Duke University at their parapsychology lab in the 1930s. And this state of relaxed sensory deprivation is a state that uh, sleep researchers call hypnagogia, and we experience it naturally twice a day, just as we're drifting to sleep at night and just as we're coming to in the morning. Great deep physical relaxation, even hallucinatory images or uh, uh, auditory hallucinations, sometimes a feeling of um, bodily paralysis or very heavy limbs, and yet we still have command over our cognition, mm. and we can direct our thoughts in certain ways. We're aware that we're in this state, and it's just a couple of minutes, but and then presumably, unless one is an insomniac, you start to drift off. And so this is considered prime time, so to speak, for ESP-related activity. And so it seems to support you know, this idea that you were driving at, that kind of calming down the static seems to help allow us uh, to be more flexible. Psychically. It's also where Neville Goddard says to put these things into practice. Boom. <laughs> and, and dig this. Neville, who I love so much for saying this, Neville uh, would consume a bottle of wine each day at lunch. And then he would say, when I was done at about 3 p.m., I would go into an easy chair and I would allow myself to doze off, go into this state, and I would dream. And that was his meditation. And somebody could say, oh, but, you know, he was drinking wine. It's like, well, mm -hmm. people have been drinking wine for a long time. Yeah. Let's get yeah. back to the Neanderthals, yeah. you know. <laughs> I mean, these altered states of consciousness have been with humanity since the very beginning. Yeah. And so, okay, that abetted what he was after, what he wanted to do. Uh, you want to do something else, do something else. You know, Use the sleep state, use a munch, whatever. That worked for him. And I so admired his just being straightforward about that. It's not often talked about, but it appears in his lectures. And he'll say like, well, today I was having a delicious slice of such and such cheese and <laughs> my usual bottle of wine with lunch. <laughs> and then he'll say he went into his easy chair and he imagined X. So I think... Um, Intoxicants, so-called, can be an accelerant. Mm. But again, it's as old as the human story. We've been distilling stuff and, and using it either for relaxation or for um, uh, uh, the flexibility of the psyche or, yeah. or for both. I can't help but I want to bring up when we did a self-imposed three-day silent retreat, um, which was really good for us. Highly recommend to anybody. Uh, yeah, because we're like, oh, we can't afford to take a week and go to some place. Like, let's just design right. our own. Um, the hell with the Berkshires. Yeah. We're going to do it right here, right? It's yeah. Too much. Yeah, right. but it was, I used to, like, be really attached to crystals, you know, really feel like I needed these this support for going into a trip. Like, did I bring all my crystals, all this stuff? But it was when I really quieted down that I could feel what each crystal does. And, like, usually I, I'm not into crystals anymore because I, I want to, like, shed things like mm -hmm. needing less and less but I remember during this retreat laying on my bed and doing like a meditation and like putting different um you know rose quartz or uh amethyst or whatever and being able to really feel the activation that was that crystal mm. and I think we've rendered these things pretty useless because there's so much static that they're not really as right. maybe valuable mm -hmm. to us because mm -hmm. we can't almost even get through to them but it was like one of these moments of validation of like whoa, if there is power to this and I need to slow down to feel it in mm -hmm. order to, I think it's like what you're saying, the try it, the experiment, the... Yeah. I, I wonder, do you know the, uh, Dr. David Hawkins? 
I know the name. But oh, okay, that's it. Yeah, he he like mapped consciousness, and and his whole practice is through uh, kinesthesiology. I don't know if you've ever oh, uh-huh. looked into that. Not I, hugely. Man, I would love if a guy like you even wrote an essay on kinesthesiology I or something. Well. Because it because it is <laughs> it's kinda like what Cass is saying. It's like it's like your body knows. It's muscle testing and like you can test it basically you can test anything through your body and he'll do it on stage. He's, you know, he'll he'll pose a gigantic question to the universe and go over to this woman who has her arm out and say it and she's barely paying attention. She's just kind of in a trance. And based on how her arm moves, like he can measure the level of consciousness that things are vibrating on. So he mapped consciousness through this and all the feelings you can have and, and what they're vibrating at and That's fast. to the point where you can fucking tell where, uh, where we're vibrating at through uh, humanity. Like we're, we're getting pretty high up and like Jesus was vibrating at 450 and like as a species right now, we're at like 200 just past like barbarianism and warfaring all mm-hmm. the time that kind of stuff but this this guy's work's really interesting it's Hawkins. really funny to try it because you could do it on like these huge questions and then these smaller questions like we had this experience we had a weekend away with some friends and someone left with sean's shoes and everyone said no i didn't leave with sean's shoes i don't know what happened and sean muscle tested me because we were joking around and it and then of the, we knew who had it we knew who had it muscle test. based on the muscle testing and then that person texted us like oh shoot sorry i accidentally just saw your shoes in my trunk uh, oh, no I kidding. accidentally had yeah. grabbed them. So it's like, I didn't know he had taken them, but like my body, there's some sort of truth. I mean, we're getting way out there now. Yeah, but, but that's yeah. fascinating. <laughs> so the idea is that we, we do have this anomalous or, or just natural intake of information, mm-hmm. but we're unable to access it. And there may be these access Or points. yeah, I am him. He is me. And yeah. through muscle testing, you can go to that part where we are each other. Well, Cass was going to a doctor for a while for like systemic issues. And she was like, I don't know. I just don't know how I have a clean diet or whatever. And this guy just like holds up samples of things behind your head. You don't even know what they are. And he's just testing you. And I went in there once and it blew my mind because I, I, uh, hadn't really been eating a lot of citrus fruits, but I binged on oranges for like four days. And the only thing he told me before I left, he was like, cut oranges out of your diet. Oh, and no for me, kidding. it was olives and lemon juice. And I was waking up every morning doing lemon water. Uh-huh. And like, I love olives. And he was like, yeah. chill on those things. And I was like, what the hell? Yeah. But Again, <laughs> it just opens up this world of like, what the hell's going on? But yeah, there's a truth out there that our bodies are tapped into. Our intellect, because we're trying to distill down a reality that works for us, can't accept or can't wrap our heads around i do want to finish that with saying ultimately it wasn't free of his ego i went to him way longer than i should have and he had me on so many medications way longer than i should have and when sean was like you're healthy your body knows how to heal like just trust yourself like you can't be relying on 300 dollars a month and supplements or whatever right Uh, come on then i was able to like myself take my healings in my own hand so it's like while we can admit and understand that there's truth to these things it's not free of the human ego of him perceiving these things and thinking i need to stay on this thing because he also needs me to be a client yeah you know yeah Yeah. (laughs) and that's one another thing you know that i i always ask people to pay attention to within the spiritual culture there's a kind of theater that goes on where we're looking for the man with the plan. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and the, the, the person we identify at the, as the man with the plan is aware of that. And there's a kind of theater that can go on. And, and one has to be cautious of that. You know, somebody may have something to impart, but anybody, whoever it is, um, the therapist, the clergyman, the guru, whomever, as soon as that person is in a position in which he or she is comfortable and is being looked to as a figure of authority, there is a certain theater going on. And that same person might not be anything like what you think when you see what happens when just some minor bit of stress uh, erupts. And right. then they're fucking furious with everybody. And, you know, and it, and it happens all the time. And mm-hmm. that's why, like, I never really groove to the question of, like, who would you want to meet? Who are your, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people that I'd want to meet simply because I might know them through their, their work and I groove to their work, but I've had enough experience to realize, of course, that, um, uh, that they're not always bringing that into the most ordinary situations of life. Yeah. That's why I want us to bring the conversation within the culture you know, to that place, because the, the, the suffering that goes on in the ordinary uh, confines of life, sometimes through minor stuff, sometimes through major stuff, 
I mean, that's where it's happening. Right. There is this like natural order and balance to things that I've at least come to trust, you know, in a way that uh, makes me not want to put anyone on a pedestal. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, it gets back to what we were talking about. That inborn uh, religious zealot is looking for a priest is looking for a priest class and you got to be careful and you just be like, Oh, is that, is that just like that thing in me wanting there to be someone else that knows more than I know? Yeah. Because isn't that the heaviest thing when you realize like, Oh, it is all on me. Like, Oh shit. I'm the one I, I know, you know, your body knows way better than some doctor who's only looked you in the eyes once, you know? So it, I mean, it's a tough thing to wrap your head around. So you definitely every now and then you just got to check that thing that is looking to worship somebody and looking for priests. And, and you'll find them. You oh, know? my <laughs> God. Because they're, they're, we, they're out there looking for us. They need customers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that, that's a tough thing. That's and they groove to it. You know, oh, yeah. That's why, like, I don't... Um, I'm interested in testimony, and I care about testimony, but at the same time, I also realize its limits because it's in a situation where the individual is being called upon to perform in a certain sense. Mm-hmm. So I'll have, like... Um, field researchers who might say, wow, I went to this new age group, you know, somewhere out there and, and everybody seemed really together. And it's like, well, dude, they know you're an interviewer. Yeah. Right. And, you know, they're not like, you know, who's this guy, you yeah. know, it's like, but go, go live with them for six months and see what the deal really is, mm. you know, yeah, totally. and see, I don't know, you know, if they keep their word to you, if they tell you they're going to help you move, do they show up to help you move? And you'll learn 10 times more in that than in an interview. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) If someone will help you move. I think that was in Seinfeld. Oh, was it? Yeah. But it's for real. I mean, you know, and and will they show up on time? Will they do it? Will they keep their word? And Mm -hmm. um, the people who have sung the sweetest songs to me about service are the first ones who, you know, stick a shiv in my ribs as soon as I look in the other direction. Because it's what we were talking about. They're compensating. You know, yeah. so they need to project that out into the world. Exactly. It's a very strange thing. Yeah. But a very understandable thing. Yeah. Totally. We all um, do it. This was awesome. Thank you. I could, I could sit here Loved and ask it. you questions forever. Amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, anytime you want to do this. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully we'll be working on some cool stuff together. Oh, I would love it. Sending that prayer out on uh, Friday the 13th, which we didn't talk oh, about. Is sweet. there, is there any is reason? The 13th. What, is there, wh- why is Friday the 13th? Oh, thing. wow. You know, I, I, I dug into it at one time, and this is what I found. It's really hard to get to the hardcore antecedents. Mm. And part of the reason why it's difficult is because, and this is kind of cool, this number 13 has a certain charge to it across a lot of different cultures. Really? Like in uh, Nordic spirituality, Loki was supposedly the uninvited 13th guest uh, at, a, at a banquet and it broke into violence. And in Vedic culture, you're not supposed to have 13 people uh, seated at a table. And then uh, Judas is sometimes said to be the 13th man yep, at, the, yep. at the Last Supper. And I've noticed that Gee, if you've got agreement between Vedic, Nordic, and Abrahamic culture, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So one thing I found is that Friday the 13th, uh, or rather the number 13, has a charge to it in all these different cultures. And if one looks, there are still a lot of apartment buildings. I was in a hotel uh, that did this in Virginia Beach a few years ago. They don't include a 13th floor. Most buildings in New York City. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm in the elevator bank, and I'm like, Holy shit, it goes from 12 to 14. Yeah. So it's like these ancient beliefs are not ever very far away. They still kind of walk with us and, and look out at us. Wow. Well, I'm thinking of it as a lucky thing. And that I, I told Cass should. before you came over, I said, five years from now, we're going to look back at Friday the 13th, 2023 is the day we started a dope new friendship and collaboration yes. Yes. and some uh, just, you know, just a cool sparkle that leads us around the world. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm psyched. Um, thank you so much. Is there any way, but what's the best way for people to, uh, I don't know. Oh, well, my website is Mitch cool. Um, on, on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz on Instagram, uh, at Mitch Horowitz 23, another number I love. <laughs> and, uh, so that's you know super easy way to stay in touch. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if uh, you. you want more from us, uh, patreon.com slash church of chill. There's tons of bonus episodes of our podcast our radio show, Church of Chill, and our Discord community. Cool. I don't know where I'm looking, but (laughs) (laughs) peace, love, and magic, y'all. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you, guys.